Welcome to the latest edition of the Food Systems Podcast brought to you by the Forum for the Future of Agriculture. My name is Mark Titrington. I'm a co-founder of the Forum and your host for today's edition. Today, I'm joined by Massimo Torero, the Chief Economist at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, Massimo, delighted to be speaking to you um, today. And this follows on from our annual conference at the end of March uh, session on food system transformation, which I, I know you're unable to, to join. And so great to have you with us um, today. Um, in that session, the Executive Vice President of the European Commission, Franz Timmermans, made what I think we describe as an impassioned plea to accelerate the transformation of the food and agriculture system and to seize the opportunities that um, provides. And he was clear that we cannot afford to miss this opportunity and that if we were to, the cost in the future will be far higher than the cost it will, it will be for us to make the transition today. What's your perspective on that, Massimo? Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And, and I think uh, I agree with what he mentioned. I think that the situation we have today is a situation where uh, the agri-food system is facing significant challenges. Uh, not only we are not resolving the problem of chronic hunger, of chronic undernourishment, uh, the number since 2015 uh, keeps growing. We are facing significant challenges like the COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine, which even exacerbate more the situation. But also at the same time, uh, the agri-food system uh, is not transforming itself to create efficiencies that we need uh, in the nature and the environment, and especially to avoid uh, potential climate change shocks, uh, which means to, to be able to achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius. So a significant challenge in front of us, a uh, significant change because Climate is not only because of emissions coming from agriculture, but it's also what will affect the most the agri-food systems. It will affect in four dimensions. It will affect in terms of extreme temperatures. It will affect in terms of excess of water or lack of water, variability of, of climate conditions, but also on evolution of pests and diseases. So it is an important point in time uh, to identify the challenges and start the transformation so that we can achieve the goal of this agri-food system, which is to achieve SDG2, but at the same time to minimize the trade-offs that I will create on the environment and the nature and on climate, so that we also have sustainability over time. I just wonder, Massimo, listening to you, a couple of follow-up questions to that. What, to what extent do you think that Europe itself is providing the leadership required to tackle some of those things that you you talked about. Um, it obviously has the Green Deal at a, uh, a macro level. In many respects, the, the new industrial economic policy of the union, the farm to fork strategy and biodiversity strategies, um, which is using to try to accelerate the transition. How do you make an assessment of that leadership that Europe is providing and what do you think the impact is on countries outside of Europe, especially in the global south, and, and how they see it? I think that Europe with the Green Deal is trying to answer the ongoing climate crisis question uh, and trying to identify a roadmap which is relevant for a climate neutral Europe, a, a, a roadmap that will allow them to put actions in place that will help them uh, to minimize uh, the potential effects they will have over, over climate. And they are doing significant uh, efforts in terms of legislation, uh, like the, the climate neutrality in, in, in the EU climate law, uh, the Fit for 55, uh, the boosting of the circular economy, uh, creating uh, sustainable agri-food systems and preserving biodiversity. But one, one challenge, um, and of course, looking at financing for this green transition, but what happens in Europe is not necessarily what is happening in other continents of the world. And that's where I think we need to, to, to understand uh, what can be handled directly by the actions of, uh, of, of Europe or a specific countries, and what is a global public good that will affect all the world at itself. And this is exactly what I was referring when we look at the agri-food system. We need to understand that the primary goal of, of the of the agri-food system is to to feed people and to feed people with not only with with calories but also to feed people with uh, diets which have all the micronutrients that we need, what we label as healthy diets. Uh, and today we have 3.1 billion people that don't have access to healthy diets. 
so close to a, more than a, a third of the glo glo global population that we are going to achieve uh, the 10, 10 billion people. Uh, but the, the point here is what is what of the actions that are happening in Europe will also have consequences on other regions of the world. Mm -hmm. So when we look at these topics, we have to be careful. Why? Because if I am going to do a transition uh, towards less emissions, for example, and I don't take into account that I want to feed more people, then I could make decisions that will create significant consequences in terms of the cost of food, in terms of food availability to the world. If I look on the other side and I look that I want to achieve the food availability to the world, and then I want to choose the pathway to minimize the trade-offs that I generate to the environment and to the and, and to the climate, then I think that will give me a better identification of what are the investments I need to be able to achieve that. So we cannot isolate climate from food. That's why. FAO is now working on 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 what we call the 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 route to the SDG two and one point five degrees because we believe they are mutually related and we believe that uh, the way to incentivize countries of the south to make some actions is by assuring that they have the investment to achieve SDG two but at the same time to as a consequence of that to have the incentives to choose the pathways that will minimize those trade offs so. That concept of a global public good, I think, is important to understand, and I think where Europe needs to think a little bit more in the system approach to be able to, to achieve that. One simple example, and I stop there. Uh, for example, we know that in, in the poorest countries, there is a need for proteins. We know in developed countries in the north, there is an overconsumption of proteins. So having policies that will restrict the production of meat will have a consequence on, on, on regions of the world that need those proteins today, while on the other hand, if we are able to produce that with the minimum uh, minimum emissions, methane emissions, that could benefit these countries and also benefit our environment, but without reducing production to achieve that commitment. So it's very important to understand the interlinkages in the world and how things are related. I think, as you say, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a complex system. And uh, I was involved in something last week looking at the role of the international grain trade, um, we obviously picked up on some of what you were talking about just then, Massimo, in the conference itself and at the end of March. And, and I want to just bring bring us back to, to what Martin Frick um, said from the UN World Food Programme, um, because it'd be interested in your perspective on this. I mean, you've got over a third of a billion people directly dependent on world programs like the world food program many more suffering from um undernutrition um and and yet you you have this impression that it's not just about production it it's about having the right food in the right places at the right time it's about avoiding food waste from from post harvest losses to the amount of food that you know we all throw away in the system just wonder what your perspective is on on that debate on 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 production and also what is being produced and the way we're consuming it. Sure. So several things. First, if I look today at the amount of calories that we produce in the world, we have enough. If I look today at the amount of food commodities that I need to be able to have all the food groups that I need to achieve access to healthy diets, we don't have enough. There are significant products that need to increase in production, and most of them are linked to high-value commodities. This means vegetables and fruits, uh, and also protein, protein, protein like fish, uh, meat, uh, and so on. So that is where the gap and where the imp improvements in productivity are needed. And at the same time, that is where we need also to assure that we produce more with less, meaning using less inputs and, and less resources. So yes, we need to keep increasing productivity, but increasing the way in which use the natural resources in a more efficient way and trying to find and use innovation and technology to minimize emissions because of that increase in productivity. That's the only way we are going to achieve on the supply side, the diversity of products that we need to be able to reduce the cost of healthy diets so that we reduce these 3.1 billion people that don't have access to healthy diets. Second, uh, we also need to look not only to the supply side, but also look to the demand side. Today, we lost around 13.8%. That's the newest number. It was 14, now it's 13.8% of food. And we waste around 17% of the food. That means around a third of the food in the world is lost or waste. Losses go up to 
wholesale included, and waste goes from retail to the consumer. Now, in the case of waste, the 17%, there are bigger problems there. One is because the way food is destroyed also creates more greenhouse gas emissions than what it was used to produce. So we really need to put policies in place on the demand side, which could help to minimize those. But we also have to have some institutionality and regulations in place that will allow us to increase the life in the shelf of the commodities so that waste is reduced. In case of the consumers, of course, we need to create capacity so that people understand how much they need to buy of food so that they can minimize their waste. Because the major problem we see at the household level is that they don't purchase what they really need. They purchase more. And as a result of that, you have a lot of food being wasted. Second, we need to find the optimal legislation to assure that you can eat healthy food and safe food, but that you can expand the shelf of the life of the food. So if a commodity is still good to eat, it needs to be in the shelf and needs to be lower price if their attributes are deteriorating, but still they are extremely healthy to eat. We need to find ways in which we can strengthen more food banks and mechanisms that will allow to move whatever is wasted from the food value chain from the retail to the consumer so that it can be used for consumption, but also using as feedstock because that will reduce other inputs being used for, for feedstock. So that's on the waste side. On the low side, it's, it's a little bit more complex because uh, if we look at the, at, the, at, the, at developing countries, the major losses are happening in high value commodities. And these are small farmers in many cases. So there is where we need to bring technology innovation. The problem we have is that most of the focus on losses has been focused on post-harvest on storage. And that's not necessarily the case. In our studies, when we look at where the losses occur, we have significant amount of losses happening pre, pre-harvest and during the harvest process. And also a lot of the produce is already with problems when it goes to storage. So we need to implement a lot of preventive methods and, and try to look at cost-effective technologies that will be useful for farmers. One example that I always use, if I am avoiding aflatoxins, which we know is great cancers to the liver, and I and I cannot observe in the grain the presence of aflatoxins, I have to test for it. So if I ask a farmer to improve their technology, to better dry their grain, to store it in, in, in the level of dryness that is needed to minimize that going to the storage capacity, and the farmer uses the little money they have to achieve that, and then he goes to the market and sells his grain, which is aflatoxin safe, free. And then another farmer that didn't do the investment takes the same grain. And given it's not observable, the market doesn't recognize for that effort and doesn't pay a premium for that aflatoxin free grain. Then, of course, the farmer will never again do that effort. So it's not only changing technology and transferring the way to produce, but it's also the institutional part of creating the standards so that the market recognizes those efforts and pays for that. That is what will make the process more attractive for farmers, and that's what will make it to work, and that's where we could reduce losses. So reduction of losses and waste is central. It's a triple win, use of better resources, more availability of fruits and vegetables, and at the same time, reduce emissions uh, to the climate. So I think we cannot argue about just emergencies. Emergencies is one part, But while we are resolving the short-term problem of acute food insecurity or or emergencies in critical situations, we need to find a way to also improve across the time through through short and medium-term policies and actions that will allow that we have the increase in productivity in a sustainable way and that we change the behavior on the consumer side to, to be able to achieve the goals that we want. You've talked at length there. Um, Massimo, about um, some of the creativity that we need to bring around the system from the consumer level to the policy level. Uh, you touched on the role of innovation and 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 that all of that comes through in the example that that you just gave. I wonder if you can step back and 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 look at this holistically and say, from your point of view, what, what do you think is getting in the way of of making this this transition at the scale and the speed that is needed? No, I think that the the problem we have right now is that if you look at the situation in the last three years, uh, we are being affected by too many shocks, a sequence of shocks: COVID nineteen, the war in Ukraine, now the Sudan 
the conflict cases and so on and so forward, which has not allowed us to uh, to really think on what are the medium and long-term policies that are needed to, to move in parallel. So we have been, and most of the donor money has been focused too much in resolving the emergency situation. That's where most of the resources are going. And we have not been able to prioritize the necessary investments that are needed to permanently move away of those emergency situations. Uh, the, the, the world, how, how it is a structure, uh, the agri-food system is a very vulnerable system. It's a system that operates under risk and uncertainties. And we will be facing this over time. So what we need to do uh, to have this, this transition process, this transformation, is to increase resilience of that system. That's the only way we will be able to cope with the short-term shocks and being able to do the transformation for the medium and long term. And when I refer to resilience, I think that there are two core components. We can say three, but there are two core components. The first one is a component where it allows me to be prepared. So early warning, uh, be able to know that there will be a shock that will be affecting me, therefore I can be prepared. Like for example, we clearly know that La Nina or El Nino is happening. That will affect many farmers in Africa. So we need to be prepared for that. We need to make them resilient because they know that this event will happen and will deepen in the next months. We also know that the Sudan crisis today, the terrible problem of the conflict in Sudan, will create a significant problem of migration out of Sudan to the neighborhood countries. And of course, it will accelerate the process of acute food insecurity and moving from IPC3 and above towards four and five in the next months because most of the UN has removed. So what we can do to strengthen them because we already know that early warning alarm. So that's the first component. The second component is how much we can absorb the shock. So how we can create a capacity to absorb the shock. And that is where the medium and long-term effects happen. Of course, there is a dimension of social protection, a dimension that we will have a system in place of social protection that will be able to respond through cash transfers or conditional cash transfers with updated rosters in the in the short term. But in the medium term, we need to prioritize investments, bringing innovation and technology so that these farmers can have varieties which are more resistant to lack of water, for example, because we know there will be a higher frequency of droughts that we are preparing in case of flooding and we know how to manage that water rather than just getting the consequences of, of flooding, that we are prepared to have technologies that will be more resistant to variabilities, that we are prepared to, to handle pest and disease evolution because of climate change. Those core investments cannot be done in the short term. There are investments that we need to develop so that we can build up those technologies and and create adoption of those innovations so that farmers increase the resilience. So the two components will be central. That's the only way we can progress in this transformation. I want to bring you back to, to at least the first part of what you were talking about in terms of resilience there, Massimo. Um, again, something I was involved in last week with the grain trade, this question of predictability came up. We can build in capacity um, we can improve our forecasting, perhaps, of the impact of climatic events. But what is more problematic is is some of the geopolitical conflicts that arise and, and clearly have an impact on the on, on the food system. You, you mentioned Sudan. You talked about Ukraine earlier in, in in this discussion. You know, I mean, how how easy is it even possible that we get better at forecasting where some of those challenges are likely to arise and, and putting in place mitigation steps um, as a consequence? Look, there are areas where we have progress. For example, we can forecast changes, changes in prices, not the absolute price, but we can forecast volatility, what we call volatility. And we can identify periods of excessive volatility in the futures market, which later on will be transmitted to the local markets at the country level. We can also predict, for example, today we have improved enormously on predicting issues like the locust, which two years ago, we were basically facing the consequences. But today, FAO has a capacity and a significant predictive power on when locusts could hit so that countries can be more, more resilient. We also have a lot of work on the One Health approach that allow us to, to prevent a, a, uh, emergence of new zoonotic reservoirs and, and how we can control from those. Now, there are areas, of course, uh, 
that will be difficult to have a significant uh, point estimate of what will happen. But a bounce of confidence interval is what we need here. So we know uh, months in advance that the probability of El Nino hitting a country will happen. We clearly know those probability distributions and we can have significant power on that sense. What you want at the end of the line is understanding those probability distributions and being able to alert a country that there is a high probability that that type of event will happen so that it gets prepared. It could be that the event doesn't happen at the end, but at least if it happens, they were already prepared. And these are investments that are not only for that event that time, they are investments that will be useful in the future. So I think I am not so negative in terms of, of our capacity to, to, to predict probability distributions. Of course, point estimates will be very complex, uh, but probability distributions, we have to work on that. We are trying right now on scaling up our 12 early warning system so that they can have some predictive power in probability distributions. When you look at the world, uh, the agri-food system, which is under risk and uncertainties, on the risk side, yes, I can work a lot in terms of having an understanding of the probability distributions. On the uncertainty, no, because uncertainty cannot be predicted and therefore cannot be insured. Now, if I am able to, to improve the predictability power uh, of the distribution of the probabilities, then that brings a bell, which is insurance. No? And the question is how much I can use insurance to cope with this as an instrument. And there are different types of insurance. There is the farming insurance, which there are a lot of innovations happening, moving from traditional to index insurance and combination of both. Still, there are challenges in terms of pickup uh, adoption and also in terms of, of the subsidy that is required. So part of it will be commercial, part of it will not be commercial. Most developed countries subsidize enormously their insurance to farmers. And there is the second group, which is more catastrophic insurance, not like the earthquake insurance, or it could be potentially an insurance on a country going into a food crisis. No? So again, I think we have to still work a lot on those tools and trying to move forward uh, on how we can improve the way our early systems uh, operate, our early system warning mechanisms operate. Just want to, you know, b build a little bit on that. I mean, the, you know, there are clearly so many actors that are part of the food and agriculture system um, in terms of building its resilience, its sustainability, delivering and responding to the forces of supply and demand. Um, I mean, I feel bound to ask you the, the question, Massimo, and I, I leave it to you to decide whether or not you want to answer it. Um Throughout the, the annual conference um, at the end of March, there was this question about the extent to which the agri-food industry is part of the solution or indeed part of the problem. Um, there was even uh, a couple of protests that took place you know, during the day that, that probably suggest that from the perspective of some civil society groups, it's more part of the problem than, than part of the solution. I'd appreciate your perspective on that. And as you talked in the in the previous um, question about the role of of insurance, you know, broadening that definition of the agri food industry to include financial players in this um, and and new providers, we had Microsoft also part of the um, of the annual conference. Do we need to broaden our definition of what the agri food industry actually is is in the component parts that make it up? Yeah, let, let me let me first clarify a concept which I think is important to clarify. So you were referring to food systems and then you refer to agri-food industry. Yeah. Okay, first, we we talk about agri-food systems. Why? It's, it's, it's honestly pretty simple. Uh, agriculture for FAO implies not only crops, but also uh, livestock, uh, fishery, aquaculture, forestry, and so on. So the definition of agriculture for FAO in its own constitution is, is a broader concept, okay? It's not just crops. Uh, now, in that sense, when we refer to the agriculture and uh, food systems, we we compress that into agri-food systems. Is we are looking to everything which is produced uh, that could go for to food, but could also go to non-food activities like, for example, fibers for textiles and, for example, uh, biofuels. Why is so important? Because if we are going to relate the production of the agri-food system to climate and to environment, we need to bring both components because both components will affect the nature and not necessarily can be easily disentangled. 
And second, because the non-food part also creates income that allows us to improve food access to, to the poor people. So, so we call it agri-food systems. So within that definition of agri-food systems, if we look at the, at the business side and, and the market structure of the business side, uh, I, I think it's important to, to rather than to say they are the, res the responsible of the problem, uh, is trying to see, okay, with the market structure that I have, what I need to put in place so that we can move forward into a system which is more efficient and provides food uh, and other agricultural commodities in a more efficient way and, and minimizing trade-offs. Now, if I take a photograph of the market structure, I will immediately see in the case of cereals, that there are five or four countries which are the key exporters of cereals. Okay, this has improved from the 2007 to 2009 uh, food prices in the sense that before they were less, and now we have Brazil that came in big in terms of production of cereals and also Argentina and Paraguay. So the diversification has improved a little bit, but it still is highly concentrated. That's why if we have a chop like a, a significant drop in Argentina, that will affect prices of wheat. If we have a chop like the war in Ukraine, where Ukraine and Russian Federation exported one third of the cereals in the world, we have a problem. So the first conclusion for me in the cereal world is I need to diversify more because I know that my agri-food systems is under risk and uncertainty, meaning that if climate change continues, the number of frequency of events of droughts and floods will increase, and I will be facing problems like the Pakistan flood that will affect rice production in the world, for example. So I need to find a way to diversify. So what I can do as, as, as the world, as governments, as the European Union, as the US and so on to diversify that is I need big producing countries of cereals that can do it in the most efficient way. And we need to find ways to create the policies to attract the investment so that we can have 10 big countries di uh, distributed across the world so that I minimize that risk. If I move to the high value commodity world, it's very different because the high value commodity world is extensive in terms of land, like you have countries like mine in Peru, where in the coast, you have large production of, of asparagus or, or, or avocados, massive in big plots, but you also have a lot of smallholder production, especially in Africa and so on. And that's where horizontal arrangements like contract farming and so on could play a role to create the scale so that you can have, you can cover the fixed costs and create the standards that you need. There we need, uh, again, uh, ways in, in which we can resolve that problem of, of, of the scale, of economies of scale. Because most of it, of the high value commodities, is produced by smallholders. And that's what we face in Africa. That's what we face in Asia. And we can learn from Asia. We can learn from Vietnam. Vietnam created corporate farming, where farmers will basically give their hectare, and then there will be a CEO that will manage the corporation, and they will get profits. And if they want, they can also work in the production. But that allowed them to create the scale to be able to cover the fixed costs that are needed to, to have the standards, to create automation, to move into more precision farming, and so on and so forth. You have other examples like what the Ethiopia Transformation Agency is trying to do in Ethiopia with wheat, where they are coordinating cooperatives to be able to create the scale. So a lot of innovation is needed also to be able to move forward. But there I cannot argue that there is one big corporation that is handling in everything. No, that's not the case. It's a lot of smallholders, a lot of atomization, on the contrary, I need to find ways in which I can create the scaling up. And then the third layer is the trading mechanism, the trading system. And the trading system, especially in cereals, has become extremely concentrated. And again, that's a point of looking at the market and trying to see, okay, is that the structure of the trading system too concentrated? What do we need to do? What policies needs to be put in place to reduce that level of concentration? And that's where regulation can play a role at the regional and sub-regional level. Now, if we expand the system to all the other interlinkages, in the case of insurance, the major problem is estimating the loss function. That's why insurance is so expensive, because if you don't have long time series of weather data, it's very difficult for the reinsurance companies to estimate the loss function. And therefore, they will charge more for the insurance because they are taking a bigger risk. And that's where institutes like FAO, the World Bank and, and others have to intensify our capacity of creating this public good of more information and tools that will reduce that risk so that the insurance becomes cheaper. Only, not only at the farmer level, but also at the global level, if we are going to look at catastrophic type of, of insurance. So we need to find a way of creating 
the public goods that are needed so that we can lower our costs because the countries, the poor countries by themselves, won't be able to do it right now, unless, of course, the farmers. So those type of public goods will help enormously to facilitate and to reduce this market failure, which is the lack of this type of information so that they can reduce the cost of the of the insurance uh, to these uh, developing countries. And, and we can expand even more. But, but again, my, my view on this is identify the structure of the market, identify the problems, see what tools we have to resolve those, and start working on those uh, so that we can move forward to a more competitive sector. Massimo, I really appreciate that the clarity and and also the the, the logical thinking that you um, brought to that that question. It is a it is a challenging one, uh, as we discovered. Um, well, not just in the conference, but over many years, um, and one that needs all different components to come together um, to make the uh, to make the breakthroughs that we're that we're looking for. Conscious of your time, um, maybe a final question to you. You know, do you think that that people institutions are stepping up to the challenge that we have in terms of food system transformation and what gives you cause for optimism look i, I think that i have lived now for a few of the crises uh, uh, in the last years i think that there has been some progress uh, i think uh, we learn a lot from 207 to 8 we learn a lot from 211 we learn a lot from COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 was something different, no? It was a different problem. It was a problem of logistics, of making the food to move. And now the war also have given us some lessons of, again, of the importance of, of market structure and especially of the interlinkages between energy and food, which is really important because it's not only now nitrogen and gas and, and the production of nitrogen for fertilizers, but it's also uh, what could happen in the future if we have to change the energy mix to be more sustainable, uh, how that will affect agriculture. So the interlinkages and understanding that we move in a system that is under risk and uncertainty, I think uh, has helped us a lot to try to better plan. Where I still see that we are not yet there and where we need to keep progressing is uh, on, on, on coordination. I think right now there is a significant space to improve coordination, not only coordination between IFIs, the UN agencies, but also between the country donors and their activities they do. We need more transparency of the investments and the actions that are being taken so that we optimize in the future synergies rather than duplicate, uh, because that creates a waste of resources when we leave in a world of significant scarcity uh, of resources. So the coordination failure that we still have requires a lot of effort uh, and a lot of alignment of incentives between the different players, because it doesn't make any sense if there is an entity that's already working or a group of entities that are doing something. A donor comes out and provides funding for something else that can destroy all these efforts of coordination. And on the same time, it doesn't make any sense for an entity that is doing something that just do it themselves. It's impossible. We need to also create partnerships. So I think reducing the coordination policy uh, failure is important in terms of the resources being put into the system. The third box uh, for me is the importance of alignment of incentives. Uh, we know that we need to assess carefully the support to the agricultural sector that countries are providing and trying to carefully assess when that support is really not responding to the what we want to achieve. Because if I am investing in, in agriculture and creating distortions, damaging more the nature or creating more emissions, then that is completely different to what I am talking about that I want to do. So I think uh, this repurposing of agricultural support towards proper incentives to achieve the goals that we want, I think is extremely important with the first exercise already in the SOFI of last year, trying to see how developed and developing countries should have different ways of operationalizing any potential repurposing. But that, that box, I think, will help us a lot to uh, minimize those trade -offs. And the, and the last box for me is that we need to understand uh, that food is a right of human beings. And therefore, we need to understand that our core objective function in anything that we do in the agri-food system is to achieve that goal. But also that we need to understand that agriculture is one of the sectors that has affected the nature and has affected and will affect climate through emissions. 
So we need to find ways in which we can clearly measure what are the best pathways of transformation that will allow us to minimize. But that won't be for free. The agricultural sector to achieve SDG2 will need investments. But if we use those investments and align them to this concept of the trade-offs, we can make countries to compensate the return in terms of more food availability, more healthy diets available at a lower cost with policies and actions that will also minimize at the same time the trade-offs. I, I think conceptualizing that in all the transformation that we're doing at the country level will be of crucial importance because it will allow us to achieve SDG2, which is uh, the right to food of people and nutritious food that at the same time have a better environment and have better climate, minimize climate change and achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius by, by 2050. I think that uh, link that, that, or the last two points that you made there are, are, are quite well linked. The, the right of people, humanity to to food, um, and the impact that agriculture has on the environment, and then how do we organize the incentives, whether public or indeed private, to uh, to deliver against uh, those goals. I think is uh, is is one of the the the, the enduring um, pursuits that that we need to continue, and almost as a podcast in and of itself, um, Massimo. I want to thank you um, greatly for taking the time to spend with us um, today on on these questions. They are difficult ones, and as I said earlier, I appreciate your clarity and logical thinking that um, that you brought to that, uh, and hugely appreciate your time. No, Massimo, pleasure. Your time. Thank, Thank you. you so much, and it was a pleasure to be with you. It, and a pleasure to have you on the uh, on the show. Massimo Torero, Chief Economist of the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to another episode of the Food Systems Podcast brought to you by the Forum for the Future of Agriculture. Please do join us again next time.